They are wanted. They are loved. They are missed. Yasmin Rayan Akri, missing since 2008. When Yasmin was a toddler, her and her brother Demarcus were removed from their drug-addicted mother's home in Kentucky after being severely neglected. The siblings were tossed from group homes to foster cares. Yasmin was enduring years of sexual abuse while in the Kentucky foster care system, which caused her to have deep emotional behavioral problems. She would seek inappropriate relations with others and had no boundaries and had low self-esteem. Caseworkers and therapists advised Yasmin never be left alone to protect herself and other children. In 2001, Yasmin and her brother went to live in Chicago with their aunt by marriage, Rose May Starnes. She even adopted the children, despite her calling the children troubled and bad-mannered. Not being able to deal with Yasmin's emotional problems along with Demarcus, Starnes would whip them with belts or lock Yasmin in the basement bedroom where her brother was. Starn said she did this because she did not want people finding out about Yasmin and again, protecting her against herself and other children. In 2005, Joyce Acree, Yasmin and Demarcus's mother would die. Around this time, their grandfather had wanted to be more in his grandchildren's lives. Perhaps get them on the weekends, he said. I couldn't make out if he did, or was this a problem for him to be able to have his grandchildren on the weekends? When DeMarcus turned 16 in 2007, Starnes would kick him out of the home. I couldn't find the reasonings why. This would be one year before Yasmin's disappearance. Yasmin is now occupying the basement bedroom apart by herself. Yasmin, despite everything she had went through, was an excellent student. She was a freshman at Austin Polytech Academy. She loved singing, listening to music, reading, and writing in her journals. Yasmin started playing sports. She even excelled at that. She even had started a job working at the YMCA. So despite her troubled past, there was hope for her yet. On January 15, 2008, Starnes was spending two days in Ilgen, Illinois, with her oldest daughter at the Grand Victoria Casino. She had won $6,000. While away, Starnes' boyfriend, a 58-year-old car washer, would be in the home with Yasmin. He would perhaps be one of the last people to see her alive. In the Chicago Tribune, along with America's Most Wanted, based on Bert's accounts of that night, Yasmin had came home from school. She'd spent several hours at the YMCA. She did a few chores, such as laundry. She got ready for the following day. That morning, as Bert would take the trash out, he noticed that the lock on the gate had been cut. The door was busted and forced open. Assuming Yasmin had went to school early, he called Starnes and told her about the cut lock. She told Bert to fix the door. When Starnes arrived home from a two-day trip, there were still no signs of Yasmin. Around 5 p.m., 
She grew even more concerned after finding out that it was a half a day of school that day. The police were called. Starnes felt like Yasmin had been abducted right out her room. Not just the cut padlock was alarming. It was heading down to that basement bedroom. And inside, her room appeared untouched. Nothing was missing, not even Yasmin's glasses that she needed to see clearly. Chicago police just called her a runaway. Yasmin had never been a runaway. Even from the worst situations that she endured, they failed to look at any other possible causes of her disappearance. They figured because she had a troubled background, this was their reasons. Yasmin's classmates had even told police that she talked about running away. They would add more salt to the wound and say that Yasmin had been calling them after her disappearance, which later all turned out to be young children giving false information to deter the case. Why? I have no idea. Starnes told police Yasmin was excited about working and that things were getting better for her. She had a troubled past, but she was not a runaway. One year after Yasmin's disappearance, Starnes was watching the local news when she saw Jimmy Terrell Smith. He had been arrested for a string of rapes around the area, and Starnes, she knew him. Around that time, Starnes had developed a friendship with the man on the second floor of the building. Jimmy Lee Hawkins was the man that Starnes was acquainted with. He had been the father of the man, Jimmy Terrell Smith, who had just been paroled after 10 years from prison on an attempted murder conviction. The Department of Family and Children's Services would take over a year to even find out that Smith had lived in the same building as Yasmin. Smith was not allowed to be by or near Yasmin's bedroom whatsoever. This was directed from Starnes herself. However, Smith and Yasmin still developed some type of friendship. You could tell he had his eyes on Yasmin. He would be caught playing in her hair. He was even caught offering her a beer. Starnes had found journals belonging to Yasmin after her disappearance. Inside, Yasmin had spoken about Terrell several times, including how she missed him sometimes. While Smith was out in the free world, he had been arrested six times for selling drugs, carrying a firearm, but he still remained a free man. Now, on the news, he's being arrested for a string of rapes. Smith had confessed to the police. He had also murdered three women. They couldn't arrest him on those charges because police said there wasn't enough proof of his claims. He would boast, quote, taking a person's life is the easiest Thing in the world. End quote. At Smith's trial for raping four, two girls and two young women, two of them being 14 and the other two were 20 and 21, Smith had abducted them from a sleepover and had taken them to an abandoned garage. He raped all four and assaulted one 
of the younger girls with an object. This heinous act would take two days. This man held all four of these women for two days. They were fearing for their lives. He then would bound and gag them while choking them out one by one until they passed out. They managed to escape and called the police. One of his 14-year-old victims had taken the stand. She told jurors Smith woke her up out of her sleep only to be raped. She said Smith stole her virginity. She recalled how he made his victim squat in the garage to use the bathroom. In court, she called him a spineless coward who tortured her. Another victim says she's now afraid of the dark. She had to quit her job, which required her to work at night. When Smith was arrested, he started to call her from jail, writing her letters just to taunt her. She was afraid someone would break into her home and attack her. She was terrified. May of 2009, Smith would stab his public defender in the neck. He also tried to hire a hitman to kill the prosecutor and the judge. Smith, who suffered a horrible childhood by his mother and fathered a son while he was a free man, he was said to have been remorseful while he was in court. So, he had 10 years taken off his sentence of 120 years. The police had confessed to not wanting to dust for fingerprints or gather up glass the evening of Yasmin's abduction, believing that she was, in fact, another runaway. Now it seemed like the police were believing Yasmin had really been abducted. Starnes had fell into a deep depression after Yasmin's disappearance. Her health started to decline. Quote, Yasmin, if you can hear this, we love you and miss you. And we are going to do our best to get you back, end quote. Starnes would hold vigils. Starnes would talk to the press any time she could to keep Yasmin's name in the press. Smith did three jailhouse interviews that haven't been released. A pastor who is related to the Acree family, along with Starnes, went to see Smith in prison. Starnes said she got straight to the point. She wanted to know where her niece was. She asked him, was Yasmin alive? He shook his head, no. He tells them, him and an accomplice took Yasmin from her room and went to a house on South Spalding. He says he helped her take her life and eventually he burned her body in a trash can. He says that's what Yasmin wanted. Starnes asked him why would he burn her body. He said he didn't want to get blamed for it. Starnes wanted to know exactly where this was, where Yasmin's remains was. She needed proof that Yasmin was no longer here, even though she believed in her heart that she wasn't. Starnes never received any proof from Smith. Police could not charge Smith with that crime, even though Smith knew exactly what she had been wearing that evening, right down to the boots that was missing from her closet, even the jewelry that Yasmin had on. In 2014, 
Starnes, at 57 years old, had died of natural causes related to her health issues, not knowing where her niece by marriage she later adopted to be her daughter was. I've read she died of a broken heart. A video of Smith in prison had surfaced. He had contraband of a laptop. I don't even want to know how it got smuggled in there. He had been recording a talk show out of his cell. The footage can actually be found on YouTube. He viciously assaults a female guard with a closed fist as she goes to retrieve the laptop as he is clearly trying to rip it apart. I can only imagine what he did to Yasmin. The case was very mishandled by the Chicago police. If something would have been done earlier, maybe there could have been some arrests, said an Cree family member. Maybe we would have known what happened to Yasmin. Yasmin has two siblings, an older sister, Sean, raised by family members, and her brother, Demarcus, who are still 15 years later looking for their sister. Quote, we've never stopped looking. We've always had hopes they would find answers. Unquote. Said her brother to Marcus. The family is doubtful she is alive. They just need closure. There is a $10,000 reward for information leading to the conviction of Yasmin's abductor and possible killer. An age progression photo of Yasmin. She is 30 years old now. She's been missing the same amount of time that she's been knowingly alive. Yasmin is a black female with black hair and brown eyes. Five foot one, 125 pounds in 2008. Samantha Elizabeth Bearmore, missing since 2004. Her nickname is Pinky. Her stage name is Sunshine. She was an exotic dancer at the time of her disappearance. Samantha had left Sugar Bear's VIP club on Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. She had got in a cab and went to her apartment. She shared with her boyfriend, Cedric Bobby Lemon. Around this time, Samantha had talked about breaking up with Cedric. Their relationship wasn't good. They had met four years prior when Samantha was dancing at another gentleman's club. Lemon had been the bouncer. In the words of Samantha's mother, quote, if you keep living the life you live in in Winston-Salem, you'll end up dead, end quote. After Samantha's disappearance, all of her belongings was still in the apartment, including her dance bag that she always had with her. It had been found in the apartment by her sister, Erica. Her family would report her missing when Erica showed up that evening and Samantha wasn't there. Samantha didn't have any transportation. The owner of the club said that she had left, but people inside the club said that she was seen outside arguing with somebody in the parking lot. We do know that that evening Samantha had made it home. Lemon also stated that their relationship was on rocky terms. He said the two had argued when she arrived. He told her that he did not want to marry her anymore. She said she was going to go and buy a newspaper to find a place to live. It didn't bother him that Samantha hadn't came back because he was used to Samantha Leaving for several days, he said that she would be with her family. 
and Lemon was assuming that's where she was, but she wasn't. Samantha's family went everywhere, posting missing person flyers of their missing loved one. Samantha's mother said she believed in her heart that her daughter was no longer alive. Lemon was arrested for a probation violation shortly after Samantha's disappearance. Lemon has arrests dating as far back as 1995, all drug-related offenses. In 2000, Samantha was convicted of a felony drug possession and received a suspended sentence. In 2004, two months after Samantha had gone missing, Lemon would receive an undisclosed amount, but I found out that that amount may have been $450,000. He had sued Sean Puff Daddy Combs in 1995 for $2.5 million dollars. He had said Combs' bodyguards had beat him up pretty badly at a Mary J. Blige concert. Around that time, Lemon was a limousine driver. Lemon offered to pay $10,000 for information on Samantha's whereabouts. Lemon would die of a drug overdose in 2018, 14 years after Samantha vanished. Taking any knowledge, if he had any, of what had happened to Samantha. She has been missing for 18 years. She would be 47 years old today. She has a daughter that was raised by relatives. Samantha's family knew she would never have left her daughter willingly. Samantha Elizabeth Barrymore, black hair, brown eyes, five foot six, 115 pounds in 2004. Eva Marie Murphy. She also used the name Eva Marie Rogers. She has been missing since October 31st, 1988. On October 31st, Eva was living in a boarding home in Miami, Florida. She left one day and never came back. Eva was 29 years old. She had two children that was in her grandmother's care around the time of her disappearance. There was absolutely no information on Eva. It wasn't even known what she was wearing when she left the boarding house. It stated that she typically wore blue jeans, sneakers, and a gold chain with a cross on it. The pictures shown of Eva are in the late 1970s. Eva has been missing for 34 years. If she was alive, she'd be 64 years old today. She has black hair and brown eyes. She was described as having an Afro-Indian textured hair. Eva stood between 5 foot 1 and 5 foot 2. She weighed between 165 to 185 pounds in 1988. Carrie Lisa Jones, missing since 2005 out of Sarasota, Florida. Carrie was last seen in Sarasota on May 1st, another missing persons case where there is little or no information. However, I did read she does have a family that wants to know her whereabouts and what happened to her. She was last seen in a blue and purple t-shirt, jeans, and possibly a necklace with a bronze coin. Carrie has been missing for 17 years. She would be 63 years old today. She is multiracial, black, Native American, 
and white. She had a tattoo of a biplane, a missing tooth on her right upper jaw. She is enrolled with three affiliated tribes at Fort Bethel Reservation. She has short brown curly hair and brown eyes. I saw in another article her eyes may be green. Carrie was five foot four, a hundred and ten pounds in two thousand and five. Tara Lynn LeSharon Johnson, nickname Terry and LaShawn. She also uses the last name Johnson hyphenated white. She's been missing since 1986 from Superior Township in Michigan. Terry Lynn was 23 years old when she vanished. Terry's boyfriend had driven her to a residence at the 9000 block of MacArthur Boulevard. He waited on her while she went inside. Terry went to get some items, was stated. She got back in her boyfriend's car and she was just never seen again. Few details were listed on this case as well. A commenter said, quote, the family has got to know more. What's the boyfriend's story? End quote. I'm hoping that the family knows way more than what the public has been offered. Terry is a black female with black hair and brown eyes. She was wearing a gray trench coat at the time of her disappearance. Five foot two and weighed 107 pounds in 1986. A lot of these cases that I am going over, and there's literally hundreds of them, if they're not found as deceased, I intend on commenting on them, even the ones that have little information. Brandy Shante Brown missing since September 1st, 2016, out of Detroit, Michigan. She was 23 years old. After a car accident, Brandy spent a short amount of time at Sinai Grace Hospital. She was discharged and she just vanished. No one knows how Brandy even left after she was discharged. Did somebody pick her up? Did she walk? While she was walking, did somebody pick her up? There was absolutely no information, but it was said she was seen two miles away from the hospital on Seven Mile Road and Forest Street, but with who? Her family does say that she was hanging with the wrong crowd around that time, but it's unlike her not to keep in touch with them, and she would never abandon her daughter, who was four years old at the time. Her grandmother fears the worst. Her grandmother would ride around anywhere she could, on any leads, what anybody knew, what anybody saw, what anybody said. She would drive to try to find her granddaughter. Brandy lived on the 18,000 block of Schaefer Highway in Detroit. She has a tattoo, Alicia, with a heart, swirls, and a date, 11 12 on her back of her right shoulder. Brandy has been missing for seven years. She is 30 years old now. Brandy has black hair and brown eyes, five foot four and 120 pounds. In 2016, there is a Crime Stoppers reward of $25,000 for information leading to Brandy's whereabouts. 
Nancy Elizabeth Branch, missing since 1992. She was 29 years old. On December 6, Nancy was making her way back home with her fiancé, Kevin Clark, 31, and a newlywed couple, Alan Stewart, 29, and Amy Haxton Stewart, 31. They had been married six weeks and was planning a honeymoon to Africa. The friends had made their way back to Santa Barbara Airport to head back to Palo Alto. The newly married couple wanted to go Christmas shopping. Now all four, along with the pilot, boarded a single engine Piper Archer plane. The last time that there was communication from that plane was eight minutes later. The pilot did not alert that there was anything wrong. Though the weather had been described as treacherous that day, the plane never arrived to Palo Alto. There wasn't even any indication that there was an accident. Investigators received a tip. It crashed near the Big Basin in California, but there was no evidence recovered or even discovered. TPT wrote that everyone on the plane is deceased, but yet it still remains a missing persons case because no one has ever been found, not even the pilot. I have even read articles that no one even knows who the pilot was. No one keeps records for that? I mean, I don't know. I did read on reddit.com that Clark and Branch enjoyed scuba, diving, traveling, and racquetball, and they met while they were working together at Advanced Micro Devices in Sunnyvale, California, and Branch graduated from Stanton University in 1984 with a degree in psychology. And both Clark and Alan are natives of the United Kingdom, so I'm taking it that this information had to be from back in 1988. There's no information even now that family members that I can find have said anything about these four missing friends along with the pilot. No information. Nancy is a black female with black hair and brown eyes. Her height was 5'3", and her weight was 120 pounds in 1992. Nancy's picture is the only picture ever shown, if you was to Google this. The other three friends, along with the pilot, no pictures are ever, ever shown, just two pictures of Nancy that are very similar at that. A 15-year-old who endured years of physical and sexual abuse in her young life was said to be a runaway by police, but she wasn't. Did she clearly fall victim to a psychopath who is now a lifer in prison, leaving behind siblings that just need closure? After a disagreement with a live-in boyfriend and exotic dancer, she just vanishes after going to get a newspaper to start preparations to look for a new residence. The only one that may have been the last one. He dies 14 years later after her disappearance, leaving behind a mother, a sister, and a daughter who hasn't seen her in years. Was her mother right? Did Winston Salem finally end her life? A woman is discharged from the hospital after a car accident and she's never seen again. Did this woman's running around with the wrong crowd have something to do with her disappearance? Her grandmother searched and searched for her to no avail, leaving behind a young daughter. A woman in the company of her boyfriend just falls off the face of the earth 
after a simple car ride. The lack of information from her case and the other case. The woman who lived in Sarasota. After all these years, family members still want to know what has happened to her. Very little information or none at all. The young woman who left a boarding house and just vanished, leaving her grandmother and her two very young children at the time? And what about an entire plane that vanishes with four passengers and one pilot never to be seen again? Families, after all these years, after all these decades, they still need closure. They are wanted, they are loved, they are missed.